Shalom, everyone. It's good to be here with you again. Uh, we're here every Wednesday, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time. And uh, unfortunately, my dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Hyland, is still not feeling uh, all that well. He's fighting off COVID. And so your prayers for his complete recovery would be greatly appreciated. Today, we're going to be tackling another very difficult subject. We're going to be talking about the Holocaust. International Holocaust Remembrance Day occurs every year on January 27th as the nations of the world commemorate the tragedy of the Holocaust that occurred during the Second World War when six million Jewish people and five million others were brutally murdered by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. It was on November 1st, 2005, 62 years almost, 61 years after the Holocaust came to an end, and sadly the world waited that long, when the United Nations passed Resolution 60.7, and uh, they established January 27th as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And this, was, this is what that resolution states. It urges, it urges every member nation of the UN to honor the memory of Holocaust victims and encourages the development of educational programs about Holocaust history to help prevent future acts of genocide. It rejects any denial of the Holocaust as an event and condemns all manifestations of religious intolerance, incitement, harassment, or violence against persons or communities based on ethnic origin or religious belief. You know, uh, the top general in the American army during World War II was General Dwight Eisenhower, who went on to be the 34th president of the United States. And he said this in a letter that he wrote at the end of World War II. He wrote it from Germany to another top general, George Marshall, on April 15, 1945, and this is what Eisenhower wrote, and I quote, the things I saw beggar description. While I was touring the camp, speaking of a concentration camp, death camp, I encountered three men who had been inmates and by one ruse or another had made their escape. I interviewed them through an interpreter. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation cruelty and bestiality were so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. In one room where they, humans, were piled up 20 or 30 naked men killed by starvation, George Patton, another general known for his toughness, uh, would not even enter the room. He said he would get sick if he did so. I made the visit deliberately, Eisenhower said. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence of these things if ever in the future they develop a tendency to charge that these allegations were merely propaganda. So it seems like both the UN resolution and the words of Eisenhower and his concern was somewhat prophetic. Why? Because Holocaust denial is on the rise throughout the world today. It is another dangerous manifestation of anti-Semitism. And of course, we know another very popular manifestation of anti-Semitism today is anti-Israelism. Uh, spreading mistruths, lies, and deception about the nation of Israel. So I want to encourage us right from the beginning 
Let us together take our stand today in these days that we live against these kinds of evils and lies. And let us hold up the banners of love, truth, and peace and confirm and affirm God's love for the Jewish people and for all people. You know, you may ask why January 27th was chosen for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The reason was it's because on January 27, 1945, Auschwitz-Birkenau, Auschwitz the largest Nazi concentration and death camp, was liberated by the Soviet Red Army. At Auschwitz, approximately 1.1 million people were murdered by the Nazi killing machine, out of which about 960 of them were Jewish, including a overwhelming number of children were murdered. The Holocaust was indeed a very dark time in history. We are friends with dozens of Holocaust survivors we have sat in their homes and heard their horrific stories of suffering, as well as their amazing stories of courage and survival. On uh, my broadcast called Your Jewish Connection, which are available in video, audio, and on podcast, you can tune in to Your Jewish Connection on your preferred podcast platform. On uh, episode 27 and also on 28, I shared some of the stories of these friends of mine who survived the Holocaust. You can find uh, those archives on reachii.org, R-E-A-C-H-I-I.org. That's our website for Reach Initiative International. You can find the audios and the videos. Or, as I mentioned, you can find Your Jewish Connection with Rabbi Stewart on your preferred podcast platform. Some of the stories I told are like the stories of my good friend, Leonid Rubenstein. His father was shot to death right before his eyes. He was a teenager. The reason his father was shot to death is because he did not see a Nazi officer and he failed to take off his hat. It was a rule that you must take off your hat before any Nazi officer. And uh, right before this teenager's eyes, his father was shot to death for not taking off his hat. He lost all 28 members of his family, all 28 members, can you imagine? And he survived not only the Minsk ghetto, but also five concentration camps. Our goal at Reach Initiative International, the motivation of my me, that both me and my wife have in our teams in Israel and Belarus, the reason we are giving all that we can to serve 500 survivors in both Israel and Belarus is to let them know that followers of Yeshua remember them, honor them, and love them, and that God cares. He cared about their suffering. He cares about them today, and he wants to be with them always, forever. If you have a desire to bless Holocaust survivors while they are still with us, most of them are in their 80s and 90s, I invite you to pray for our work and support our work you can bring joy and practical help to a Holocaust survivor for just a gift of only $30. For your gift of $30, joy and practical help to a Holocaust survivor. And uh, if you are so moved to do that in this season during the time of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which will come tomorrow, Thursday, the 27th, we would like to send you a free ebook. It's the story of Holocaust survivor Irina, and uh, it is about, and it's entitled, How Can You Believe in a God Who Would Allow the Holocaust? Irina's story 
is an amazing and inspirational read. Uh, so I invite you to take advantage of that opportunity. We'll send that to you for your gift of any amount. We suggest a gift of $30 to help us bring joy and practical help to one Holocaust survivor. Now back to Auschwitz for a moment. The commandant of the Auschwitz uh, uh, death camp was a man named Rudolf Hess. He had been raised by devout Catholic parents. He was noted by, uh, he was noted for his methods at Treblinka death camp by building his gas chambers 10 times larger so that they could kill 2,000 people at once rather than 200. He commented himself, still another improvement was made over Treblinka was that at Treblinka, the victims always knew they were to be exterminated exterminated. And at Auschwitz, we endeavored to fool the victims into thinking that they were going through a delousing process. I ask myself, perhaps you do as well, how callous, how deceived can a human being be to think that killing, the killing of innocent human beings, including beautiful children, children like yours and mine, grandchildren like yours and mine, siblings like yours and mine, was simply a business that needed to be done more effectively, more quickly, and more cost efficient. How hard hearted and devoid of human affection, he and so many others in the Nazi regime had become. With Cyclone B, he said that it took three to 15 minutes for the victims to die, and that we knew, quote, we knew when the people were dead because they stopped screaming. Questions keep running through my mind, perhaps yours as well. How could this have happened? How could people do such cruel and hearts, heartless things to other people, including women and children? How could they even sleep at night? You know, Germany before the Holocaust was a country that was considered very advanced, well-educated population and very civil, civilized. An unlikely group of people to systematically humiliate, torture, starve, and murder innocent men, women, and children. As we attempt to answer these questions, I want to point out that it's almost impossible to answer these questions without understanding the spiritual dimension of life. You know, the Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, these were the words of Yeshua, Jesus. He said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and life more abundantly. The thief that he's speaking about is what the Bible speaks about as the adversary, the deceiver, the accuser, the devil. And uh, you know, the devil has no limits in the kind of evil thoughts that he puts into men and women that already are inclined toward evil thoughts. Now, you know, some people say the devil made me do it, but I want to emphasize right now that even though the devil is a strong and his demons are a strong spiritual force to provoke evil thoughts, attitudes, and actions in human beings, every person is responsible for his or her or her decisions and his or her behavior. We will all stand before the God of Israel, the God of heaven and earth, the God of creation, and he will judge us based upon the decisions that we've made and the way we've lived our lives, whether we have loved him and loved our neighbor and followed his teachings and commands, or we've rebelled against him and, and been selfish and evil or whatever and mistreated those around us. 
Now, I want to get into a segment here that I, I want to label. We can call this segment lies, lies, and more lies. I want to create the foundation by which Hitler and the Nazi regime, they kind of sprung board off of this foundation in Europe of lies, 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 and deceptions about the Jewish people in order to accomplish the evil that this Nazi regime, the Holocaust, the Nazi regime would, would uh, bring about, the Holocaust. So in Europe and beyond, there has been this false teaching and false belief that the Jews killed Messiah and killed Jesus, and all Jews in every generation are guilty of his blood. We are Christ killers. I remember growing up in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, one time a, a bunch of uh, guys came with boards, nails through it, and I was hanging around with some of my friends, most of them Jewish, and they called us the Jewish Christ killers. Even church fathers, such as St. John Chrysostom, echoed this belief, and it goes on to this day. It was a popular teaching for centuries in both the Russian Orthodox and the Catholic Church. Blood libel, a false belief that Jews would kidnap Christian children to use their blood for ritual purposes. These things do not happen. All Jews did not kill Yeshua. I did not kill Yeshua. My mother and father did not kill Yeshua. Not even all the Jews who lived in Israel 2,000 years ago when Yeshua declared himself in Israel, the Messiah of Israel, the King of the Jews. Not all the Jews then killed Yeshua. Many of them followed him. Acts 6-7 says a great number of the priests, these are the priests who rejected him and handed him over to Pilate, became believers. We know Nicodemus and Joseph were believers. All of his apostles were believers in Yeshua. They were followers of his. So all the Jews in his day, today, in every day, were not guilty of his blood. This is a terrible lie and false teaching. The Black Plague, you know, the Jews were blamed for causing it and spreading it. Why were the Jews less, less affected? They were following God's hygiene guidelines given to them through Moses in the Torah. And instead of the non-Jewish neighbors around following this good example that God had given to the Jewish people that kept them safer from the Black Plague than it did their Gentile neighbors, instead of following the example, they falsely blamed the Jews. And many died, many Jews died as a result. And of course, many Gentiles lost their lives to the Black Plague, but could have avoided it. Desecration of the host. This is about the host in the Catholic Church, a false belief that Jews would sneak into the church and stab the host as a mockery of the crucifixion. Oh, come on. Judensau, the Jewish pig in English. Violent, degrading depictions of Jews involved with pigs. This image first appeared in the Middle Ages, mostly in carvings on church and cathedral walls, often outside of the buildings where it could be seen from the street. This was very popular for about 600 years. These sculptures illustrate the Christian anti-Semitism that was prevalent in, in Europe and that the Nazis were effectively able to draw upon to accomplish their evil. Shockingly, some of these sculptures still exist in European churches and cathedrals today. Jews depicted as an owl, owl. They would be depicted as owls because owls were depicted as dirty birds who preferred the, the dark, just as Jews were considered to be dirty, who preferred to be in the dark as opposed to the light of Christianity. 
what people were calling Christianity back then, though it seemed to lack what Yeshua would call love, loving your neighbor, even loving your enemies. <clears throat> the Nazis had a strong focus on the dehumanization of the Jewish people that would influence the German public and would be a foundation for their final solution. The final solution, that is to rid Europe of all Jews through the systematic murder of them all. During the Holocaust, the Nazis referred to Jews as rats. You might recall that the Hutus involved in the Rwanda genocide called the Tutsis cockroaches. Slave owners throughout history considered slaves subhuman animals. And we must understand that when the Nazis described Jews as subhumans, they did not mean it metaphorically. They didn't mean that they were like subhumans. They meant they were literally subhuman. Thus, since they were subhuman, you could kill them like any other animal and feel good about it even. The lie of dehumanization is always a foundation for foolish people submitting to evil lies and then to do great evil in order to, as Jewish Yeshua said, to steal, kill, or destroy another people, to do the will not of their father in heaven, but the will of their evil nature and satanic forces. Another thought shocking thing might be the theme of Martin Luther and anti-Semitism. You know, we're all familiar with the great uh, work of Martin Luther when he declared that we are saved by grace through faith, and that is not by works. And in the early phases of Luther's career, career until around 1536, he expressed sincere concern for the plight of the Jewish people in Europe and was very enthusiastic about the prospects of converting them to Christianity through his religious reforms. Being unsuccessful in that endeavor, later in his career, Luther denounced Judaism and called for harsh persecution of its followers so that they might not be allowed to teach. In a paragraph from his writing on the Jews and their lies, he deplores Christensen's failure to expel the Jewish people. Moreover, he proposed, and you'll be shocked by this if you have never heard it, what shall we Christians do, Luther said, with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? Here's a brief summary. First, set fire to their synagogues, or schools. This is to be done to honor our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see we are Christians. Second, I advise their houses be raised and destroyed. Third, I advise that their prayer books and Talmudic writings be taken from them. Fourth, I advise that their rabbis, their teachers, rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews, for they have no business in our countryside. Sixth, I advise, <clears throat> sixth, I advise that uh, they not be allowed to uh, take usury and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them. Seventh, I re recommend putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle in the hands of young, strong Jews and Jewesses, Jewesses and let them earn their bread in the sweat of the brow. But if we are afraid, this is another quote from Luther, but if we are afraid that they might harm us or our wives, children, servants, cattle, etc., then let us emulate the common sense of other nations such as France, Spain, Bohemia, and reject them forever from the country. Tragically, Luther lost touch with his Jesus, with the real Jesus and biblical Christian love. His evil statements were fuel for the Nazis and Hitler sought to fulfill each and every one of them.
You might also ask, and this question begs to be answered, why did so many in Germany who professed faith in Jesus not speak out on a larger collective scale and stand firmly, firmly against the Nazi evil? One of the factors was the Nazifying, the, the Nazifying of the belief in Jesus. See, the Nazis claimed to be a believing movement. They split the Protestant church. There was the more traditional Protestants, the confessing church, and then the Nazis were part of the movement called the German Christians. And uh, they Aryanized Jesus. They removed any Jewish influence from the Bible. They divorced Jesus Yeshua from his Jewishness and the Jewish people. They looked to Martin Luther and his anti-Semitic words for inspiration. <coughs> and they sought to eradicate all of biblical Jewish influence on German church life. You know, sadly, anti-Semitism is on the rise again around the world. And we must make a decision to not forget the lessons of history, to not be indifferent, but to take a loving stand in prayer and in action against all anti-Semitism, all anti-Israelism, and all forms of prejudice and bigotry for that matter, and say, never again, never again. We cannot hide our heads in the sand. This is not a time for fear. This is a time to stand up. Stand up. Holding up those banners of love, peace, and truth, and courageously standing against hatred and violence. Holocaust survivor, world famous Ellie Wiesel said it this way, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. Silence encouraged the tormentor, never the tormentor. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormentor. Another world-renowned Holocaust survivor, Simon Wiesenthal, expressed the same lesson with these words, for evil to flourish, it only requires good men to do nothing. We as good people, we must not stand by indifferent. We must not do nothing wherever and whenever anti-Semitism, hatred, and evil rears its ugly head. We must stand up for God's goodness, justice, and truth. One more quote. Pastor Martin Niemöller, he was a Lutheran pastor in Germany, and he started out as an anti-communist supporter of Adolf Hitler, but later opposed the Nazis as he saw what was developing. He spent several years in concentration camps during the Holocaust. These are his sobering words, a sobering call for us to stand to stand against all bigotry, hatred, and injustice. I quote Pastor Nimola. First they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. At Reach Initiative International, we are not only committed to pray and to speak up against anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and bigotry, but we are also committed to serving and blessing Holocaust survivors while this aging group of people who have suffered so much suffered beyond what you and I can imagine. We want to serve them, honor them, bless them while they are still with us.
to demonstrate in some small way that God cares and followers of the Messiah of Israel, Yeshua, love and honor them. And we are, and we have great teams in Israel and in Belarus serving more than 500 survivors at this time. And we want to do more. So if you want to partner with us, please visit our website, reachii.org, R-E-A-C-H-I-I.org. As I mentioned earlier, we suggest a gift of $30 to help us bring practical help and joy to Holocaust survivors. And we want to send you a gift of appreciation to thank you for your prayers and support. Ask for Irina, Holocaust survivor, her story. How can you believe in a God who allowed the Holocaust? So let's bring this to a close. International Holocaust Remembrance Day, January 27th. Yom HaShoah, Israel's day of special remembrance, in addition to January 27th. Uh, there's a special day that uh, occurs in Israel each year called Yom HaShoah. We'll be doing another episode on that during this spring. Yom HaShoah falls in the spring, usually March, April. So let's close now with a word of prayer. Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of heaven and earth, you are a God, you are the only God, and you are a God who loves people. You sent your only son, your only begotten son, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, to set us an example of what it looks like to be a human being who lives according to love, truth, mercy, goodness, and justice. But not only you sent him to set us free from the bondage of sin and death and from the bondage of Satan and his evil plans. You gave us forgiveness of our sins through Yeshua's death and resurrection. You gave us power to overcome evil and to love and to do good even when it's not convenient, even when it's not easy. And so I ask you now, Lord, as anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, anti-Israelism spreads around the world, how Iran and its proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas, and others seek to wipe the Jewish people off of the land of Israel and to destroy every single one. Lord God, we pray that those of us who are Jewish, those of us who name the name of Jesus, those of us who are Christians, those of us who are Messianic Jews like myself, that we will stand together for your truth, your goodness, Lord, and that together through our prayers and our compassionate yet clear action, we say never again, never again. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We look forward to being with you again next week right here on the REACH Initiative Facebook page, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, next Wednesday. And uh, we'll be talking about some other interesting and inspirational and important subjects. Until then, may you and your loved ones be abundantly blessed and stay healthy and well. And keep Rabbi Hyland in your prayers for a full recovery from COVID. Shalom. Until next week.